It's hard to believe that in just a few hours, we're gonna say goodbye to 2023 and welcome in 2024. A new year is something that can be really exciting because it's a fresh start. It can also be extremely unsettling because you and I have no idea what's in the forecast for our lives next year. There are gonna be some of those days that are bright and sunny, but you better bet there's going to be some dark and stormy ones as well. I remember a few years ago, my family and I, we traveled out to the Panhandle of Texas to see this beautiful spot God has made called the Palo Duro Canyon. We grabbed a hotel room in Amarillo, and one afternoon I decided I was gonna go for a run. Well, I took off on the trail, and way off in the distance there were these dark storm clouds. That should have been my first sign to turn around and go back, but I didn't. As I was jogging along a little further, I noticed this truck off the trail observing these dark storm clouds. On the side of the truck, it said, Storm Chaser. I knew then I should have turned around and went back, but I didn't. I kept running along, and those dark clouds that seemed so far away quickly made their way on top of me, and it began to rain and thunder and lightning and hail. It was a wide open sprawling field and I had absolutely no place to take shelter so I just had to endure and run through this storm. Well it quickly passed and I finished my run and I got back to the hotel a little worse for the wear. But three things happened to me that day on the trail. One, I ran into a storm. Two, I ran through a storm. And three, I ran out of a storm. The truth is for all of us today, we're either going through a storm, we just came out of a storm, or we're getting ready to go into a storm. And when I say a storm, I mean the real hurts and pains that come with this life. I'm talking about you lost your job, you poured yourself into this company, and you have no idea why you were let go. I'm talking about broken relationships. You poured yourself into your children for years, and it's the holidays, and you've barely heard from them. I'm talking about you've committed to one man or one woman for life, and there's been infidelity in your home. Maybe you've been a victim of abuse or you've been marginalized because of your socioeconomic status or the color of your skin. You've written obituaries and planned funerals and buried more loved ones than you can remember. You've set up the nursery, you've picked out a name, maybe even had a baby shower and you had a miscarriage. You're sitting here today in a great deal of pain as you deal with chronic illness and you just can't seem to find relief. Of course, you know we all have expiration dates, but your doctor has told you that yours is coming sooner than expected. And I could go on and on and on, but the point is it is sunny one moment and the next that storm is bearing down on you. My goal today is to begin to help each other live in the eye of our storms. You know, I've heard the eye of a hurricane is calm and peaceful. I don't know, I've never been there, but I do know this. There is something extraordinarily special about having a calm and peace about you when everything around you seems to be unraveling. So how do you get to the eye of your storms? Well, it begins with this. Number one, it's having God's perspective on my storms. See, the truth is you have a theology of suffering. It's just a matter of what kind you have. Is it shallow and squishy or is it robust and biblical? Unfortunately, too many people have fallen into the heretical trap known as the prosperity gospel. It's this false teaching that says you're never supposed to suffer. God wants you filthy rich and in pristine health. Of course, this is all predicated on you sending that TV preacher just the right amount of money. And of course, I'm always amazed when I turn on the television, I see one of these TV preachers asking for money that they're wearing glasses, you know, think they could do something about that, but I digress. You may not have been hooked by the prosperity gospel, but I gotta ask you, have you bought into a lighter version of it? You're not expecting God to give you a Maserati, a beach house, or six pack abs, but you struck up this deal with God in your head and you're saying, God, I'll do one, two, and three, and in return, you owe me a happy life. Where Here's where that all gets dismantled. It's when, not if, but when a storm happens, that shallow, squishy theology that, theology that you're holding onto, it's not gonna hold you. And you're gonna stand and you're gonna try to interrogate the God who does no wrong with things like this. God, it's not fair. God, if you love me, you would stop this storm. Or God, I know you love me, but I don't think you can stop it. And you begin to tread in very dangerous territory, questioning the character of God. You find yourself expecting things from God that he never promised to us. 
So how do we move away from this poor perspective into the proper perspective on our suffering? We first of all have to understand that suffering exists in a sinful world. You can trace this back to Genesis chapter 3. God gave Adam and Eve a very strict rule. They broke that rule, and he promised if they broke that rule, there would be pain and death that entered the world. And so the very existence of pain and death today is simply God just keeping his word to Adam and Eve back in the book of Genesis. And so as a result, we now live in a post-Genesis 3 world where everything is marred by sin and broken. You don't believe that, just turn on the news. You see the devastating impact of sin all around. We are fractured from the fall. Now, if you miss Genesis 3, a lot of the problems in the world and in your life, they're not gonna make sense. And I think in our church, most people would affirm that. They would understand that suffering is gonna happen because we live in a sinful world. But there's another part of this perspective that's a little harder to wrap our minds around. It's a little harder to grasp. Suffering does happen in a sinful world, but suffering is also allowed by a sovereign God. There are a few verses of scripture where the curtain is pulled back and we get to look into heaven and see what's happening. One of those is found in Job chapter one. We get a sneak peek into this celestial conversation between God and Satan. It picks up in verse six. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. So you have Satan and some demons who go and present themselves to God. Down in verse eight, the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's nobody more righteous than him. What about Job? If you're looking for someone, here's Job. Now listen to Satan's response in verse nine. Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? In other words, God, you are so good to him. If you were not so good to him, he would curse you like so many other people do. And then down in verse 12, the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. Another instance is in the New Testament in Luke chapter 22, verse 31. Jesus says to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. So consider what we just read. Job is given over to Satan by God, and Satan comes to God to demand Peter. So we can conclude that in some way, shape, or form, Satan is seeking various ways to attack us as well. And though God, he is not the author of sin, he does allow certain things into our lives. Now, I'll give you a word of caution on this. Don't speculate on this too much. We're not privy to any celestial conversation that might be happening between God and Satan. There are some things that we just don't know, and the truth is, God doesn't owe us an explanation. So what do we do in these theological conundrums? Well, we focus on what we do know, and here's what we know. We know that even though God allows some hard things to come into our lives, he is limiting and he is regulating our most powerful and fierce enemy in Satan. I've heard it said that Satan is like a rabid dog on a leash. God may give him a little more rope to roam. God may pull back that rope and take the slack out. But regardless of how much room he has to roam in our lives, God still has his hand on the leash. So for us to deal with storms, we first of all have to understand that suffering is going to happen in a fallen world. There's no exemptions. There's no opt-outs. You will suffer. But the good news is these storms aren't a surprise to our God. Even though he allows them, he is sovereign. So once you're expecting storms, you've got the right perspective, which then will bring you to number two. You're finding yourself in a place to begin to seek God's purposes for your storms. When someone suffers, we'll often look and go, oh, don't worry. Why don't you just apply Romans chapter eight, verse 28 to that problem? And it says this, for we know for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now this is an absolutely appropriate verse for suffering. It's a verse that I share with people who are suffering. It is not, however, helpful when we share it with man's view of good. Consider for a moment if you had to have surgery for a malignant tumor. Does the surgery, the pain, the recovery, the lost time, the bill, does any of that feel good? Of course not, but is it for your good? Absolutely. And so suffering is something that God often has to use to bring out his good, his best in us. So what kind of good might God be seeking to accomplish in the middle of your storms? Well, first of all, God purposes storms to do something in you. 
God can do a variety of different things in you through a storm. He can do one to mature you, to show his power and his grace, to prepare you for a ministry assignment and various other things. But I wanna take some time to highlight two specific purposes that God might use to do something in you through your storm. And the first one is this, he might allow a storm into your life to draw you to repentance. You know, we live in a day where people just don't wanna take personal responsibility. But the fact of the matter is we have to own up to the reality that we often bring suffering into our lives by our actions. I think about King David. King David committed the sin of adultery with Bathsheba. He tried to cover it up, it didn't work, and so he murdered her husband Uriah. Well, God sends Nathan the prophet to him, and in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, here's that exchange. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, by this deed, you have utterly scorned the Lord. The child who is born to you shall die. David sinned. He confessed. Was he restored in his relationship to God? Absolutely. But did it take away the consequences? No. We have to understand that sometimes suffering comes directly connected to our actions. And we see there were still consequences for David on earth. He lost his child. And so in some suffering, it could be that the Lord is disciplining you to bring you to repentance. The writer of Hebrews draws back from Proverbs 3 in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. It says, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So in these cases, when we're being disciplined by the Lord, how are we to respond? Just like David did with confession and repentance. But we have to remember it may not take away those earthly consequences. Divine spankings don't feel good, but remember they are for our good. Second word of caution when it comes to suffering for you is just don't speculate too much on this issue of discipline. Not every storm you go through is God taking you to the woodshed, but during any trial, it's always wise to stop at the beginning and in the middle and of course at the end and always check our heart for any unconfessed sin that we need to repent of. You know, if you go back to Job, Job showed us that suffering is not always directly connected to our sin. John chapter nine does that as well. You have Jesus and his disciples, they pass this blind man. The disciples look at Jesus and they say, Jesus, was it he or his parents that sinned that caused him to suffer in this way? John chapter nine, verse three, Jesus corrects their theology. And he says this, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. God will allow a storm suffering into your life so that his works might be displayed in you. It is ultimately for his glory and our good. But here's another purpose that God might do in you through your storms that really rest in all the other purposes. Regardless of the trial, your storm is gonna bring you to a greater reliance on God. I mean, there is nothing that can humble a person that can show their inadequacies like a trial. The Apostle Paul, who we're gonna reference often, knew this all too well. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses seven through 10, Paul speaks of God keeping him from becoming conceited because he had received all of these revelations from God. So a thorn was given to him in the flesh. And this is what Paul says, it was a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So in these preceding verses, Paul's been sharing about the different revelations that he has gotten to see. Paul got to go to heaven. He's written scripture. He heard directly from Christ. And that is something that can make anyone, even Paul, very arrogant and conceited. And so the Lord wanted to make sure that he did not. And so he gave him a thorn in the flesh. Now, scripture doesn't tell us exactly what this thorn is. I have my theory, just like many other people do. But the point is this. Paul asked God to remove it three times. Will you take it away? Will you take it away? Will you take it away? And three times God said no, no, and no. Did Paul enjoy the pain of that thorn in his flesh? No, but was it for his good? 100%. He knew that that thorn that God had sent into his life, allowed to come into his life, was going to bring him to a greater reliance on the Lord and not himself. So Paul received it and accepted it from the Lord as a blessing. 
Don't miss out on God using the storms in your life to do the same in you. But also realize that those storms are not just God doing something in you. God also purposes those storms to do something through you. And one of the ways that he can do this is through evangelism. If we go back to the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, we see God using storms to build his kingdom. Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. You see, the Lord used Paul's time in prison to advance the gospel. It says the whole imperial guard heard about Christ, and I'm sure that reverberated throughout the region. Your trials, they're going to take you to places you never would have gone. They're going to put you in positions to meet people that you never would have met. You may be stuck in a hospital room for a couple of weeks, and every single person that comes in that room, they get the opportunity to hear the gospel from you. Would you have had that chance without the storm? Absolutely not. See, because people will look at you and they'll see you living in the eye of your storms and it will impact them in profound ways that God can use for gospel opportunities. They may see you struggling and they look at you and they say, what is it that you have in you that helps you to handle your situation in this way? And you can respond to them, oh, it's not what I have in me, it's who I have in me. And let me tell you about them. God can also use these difficult seasons not only for evangelism, but for edification. He can use it to encourage and to build up our brothers and sisters in Christ. If you go back to Paul's prison cell, Philippians 1, verse 14, and he says, Most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. These other believers saw how Paul was handling his trials, and as a result, they became bolder in their faith. Your suffering can be used by God in countless ways to build up the church. See, God has purposes for your storm, and they're rooted in doing something in you and through you. In suffering, it's an ideal vehicle for that to happen because there is nothing that can empty us like a storm. A woman by the name of Nancy Guthrie, who experienced a great deal of grief, wrote a book, and I love this title. It's called God Does His Best Work on Empty. And he does, because our trials force us to let go of what we're holding on to and cling to him. It really makes us live out John the Baptist's words in John chapter 3, verse 30. He must increase that I must decrease. Those living in the eye of their storms, they expect storms to come. And then they seek to find the purposes in them. But thirdly, they don't have to go through them alone. We all need God's presence with my storm. One of the biggest challenges during a storm, you feel lonely. You think no one has ever gone through this. No one has had it this bad, but you know that's not true. You know that other people have experienced what you're experiencing and many have done so even worse. And God wants you to know that you've got more partners in pain than what you ever can realize. You are never in your storm shelter alone. You're never hunkered down alone. First of all, just look around you. And in looking around you, look behind you. There are so many past sufferers in church history that can be an incredible example to us to encourage us in our suffering. I learned about two earlier this year who paid the ultimate price in their suffering for the Lord. There were two ladies named Margaret. They lived in Scotland and they refused to bow their knee to King Charles in the Church of England. They had somewhat of a farce of a trial and they sentenced these two Margarets to death. The older of the two, Margaret McLaughlin, was put out into the water at low tide and tied up to a stake. The younger of the two, Margaret Wilson, was put out into the water at low tide and tied to a stake closer to the shore. They figured the younger Margaret would see the high tide come up over the older Margaret and she would recant, watching her drown. Well, she watched her drown, but they did not count on her not recanting. In fact, she drowned, and the account goes singing scripture. Psalm 25, verse 7, specifically. The way these ladies and many others have been victorious in their suffering throughout church history is such a motivation and encouragement to me, and I know it can be to you as well. But that's just the church history side. We can go all the way back into the scripture. It is filled with people and their storms. We've mentioned Job. He lost his health, his wealth, his family. His wife and his friends were of no help to him. We've studied Joseph. He was falsely imprisoned 
falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, sold into slavery by his brothers. He was forgotten about. You look at John the Baptist. He was arrested. He was put into prison. He laid there weary and doubting and ultimately beheaded. And we could go on and on and on. But if we go back to Paul, he chronicles many of his sufferings in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 27. Listen to some of the things that Paul experienced. Far more imprisonments with countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hand of the Jews the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, without food, in cold and exposure. I've never experienced these things, but our brother in Christ, Paul, did. He knew suffering. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't point us to our ultimate sufferer, Jesus Christ. No one suffered like Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. Charles Spurgeon, a great hero in the faith, he knew suffering. He died at a relatively young age. Even for that time, he dealt with depression. He had been slandered through something known as a downgrade controversy. He had many physical ailments from kidney disease to gout to arthritis. Listen to what he wrote. Do you expect to be crowned with gold where he was crowned with thorns? Shall lilies grow for you and briars for him? If Christ suffered, you can bet we're going to suffer too, and even more so if we wholeheartedly follow him. Those are some people around us that are behind us, but what about beside us? In this church at Geyer Springs, there are sufferers in the present that we can lock arms with. There are some people who have walked through the very storm that you are in today, and God desires to use them to minister to you in specific, special ways. Now, I've got to say this. We don't want to be a place ever where sin is excused. We don't want to overlook sin. We want to apply the Word of God to the sinful issues of life. And we don't ever want to become a place where, and excuse the way I'm going to describe this, puke parties. We get together and I just puke up all my problems on you and you puke up all your problems on me and we just wallow in them. That's not sanctification. And unfortunately, that happens too often. But here is where God would be honored. If we continually strive to be a place where hurting people can be authentic, vulnerable, comforted, and help to honor Christ through the truth of His Word. So in times of suffering, don't pull back from the presence of God in the church like so many people do. You need the people of God. And of course, that most important presence isn't around you, it's within you. The Lord is with you any place, any time, for any storm, whether it's a light shower or an F5 tornado, He's hunkered down with you. We'll say more about this in our next point, but until then, listen to the words of David. David's being pursued by Saul's army, and in Psalm 34, verse 18, he writes, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Even when everybody else abandons you in the most torrential conditions, you never have to struggle alone. We've got His presence in our pain. Fourthly, I need God's power for my storms. I hope you've realized that there is no way that you and I can handle a storm, a trial, a difficulty on our own strength. And the good news is that our Lord has not left us empty-handed. The problem is in difficult times, the things that we need to do the most are often the very ones that we do the least. And God has given us those basic fundamental practices of prayer and the Bible. Prayer is like a radio and the Bible is like a compass that He has given us in a storm to communicate with Him and to have direction, to strengthen us in storms. And they are available to us anytime, any place, and for any storm. First of all, we see there's power in prayer. Paul writes to the church at Philippi in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Paul says here, give God your pain. Now, we discovered he may not completely remove it, but you are guaranteed if you give God your pain, what is he going to give you in exchange? Peace. 
peace of God will flood you. And we know this. We know that we're to give it to the Lord. We know that we're to hand it over to Him, but we still struggle to pray. Or when we do pray, we struggle to pray in the right way. Be encouraged by Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. See, when we're in pain, we'll often limit ourselves to very temporal prayers. God stopped the pain. Now that's absolutely appropriate to pray, but it shouldn't stop there. Our prayers should be more purposeful. Paul tells us that as we're praying, the Holy Spirit is praying for us. When we feel prayerless, the Holy Spirit is still praying for us. When our prayers fall short of where they need to be, the Holy Spirit picks up where they lack and He prays for us in the will of God. It says He's groaning for you. He's caring. He's feeling the weight of your suffering. But there's somebody else as you pray that's also praying for you and with you. Romans chapter 8, verse 34 says, Christ at the right hand of God interceding for us. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 15 and 16 says that Christ can sympathize with our weaknesses. He knows what you're experiencing. It also says that we can boldly come to His throne. What kind of throne is it? Well, the text says it's a throne of grace. He welcomes you to come. And Jesus, as the ultimate sufferer, knows your pain and says, Come to my throne, that throne of grace. So put this together. As you're praying, as others are praying for you, You've got the Holy Spirit within you praying. There's that presence again that we talked about in our last point. Christ is at the right hand of the Father praying for you. So whether in heaven or on earth, you are covered. So let me challenge you with this. You should always have somebody in your life that's in a storm that you're praying for. Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11, you must also help us by prayer. The Corinthians helped Paul with prayer. Who are you helping with your prayers? How can God use you to pray for someone? Find someone and commit to be faithful to do it. There's something else that you can do. God has put into each one of us a physical mechanism to deal with grief. And I realize that we're all different on the scale of our emotions and how we express them. But in your pain, in your prayers, have you just had a good cry? Have you wept before God? It's absolutely appropriate. If you look at the Bible, there are countless people who wept in their pain. I think of Hannah, she wept in her barrenness. I think of David, who we referenced in the loss of his child, wept. I think of Jesus, that ultimate sufferer who showed up knowing he was gonna raise Lazarus from the dead, still wept. We see instances of him weeping over Jerusalem. Here's what happens when you cry. Psalm 34 verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous, his ears towards their cry. He hears your cry. I think of a mom on a play date with other moms and children and they're all on the playground together and there's one kid that starts crying among the other 10 that are there. That one mom responds quickly because she knows the cry of her child. Now for everybody else, it just all sounds like the same cry, but she knows specifically who is crying and what they need. That's how God is with us, so tender that He knows your cry. He knows it. So in prayer, we get to talk to God about our pain. It's from the Bible that He talks to us in our pain. So when we look at the Bible, it's in the Bible that God is gently reminding us of who He is and what He does for us in the storms. There's many things that we could say from the Bible that God wants us to know for our storms, but I want to highlight two, these two storm shelter truths for you to remember in suffering. First of all, God tells us He's not going to leave you in a storm. There it is again, His presence with you. This means He's not going anywhere. He is with you hunkered down for the long haul. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I mean, God's always good on His Word. He's going to do exactly what He says He's going to do. And in life where things are constantly changing, God's not changing on you in your storm. He's immutable. It means He doesn't change. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, For I, the Lord, do not change. So since God's not changing, He's not leaving you, you can rest on the immovable facts of His Word and not our fickle feelings. Another word that God has for us in His Word, it's not only that He's not going to leave us, but He's not going to stop loving you. There's different types of love. 
noted in the original languages of the Bible. One that I want to point out to you is an Old Testament word, and it's a word that I can't do justice, but it's the word hesed. Hesed is a heavy word, and it carries the weight of God's mercy, compassion, love, grace, faithfulness. It's God's direct action of His unfailing, loyal, limitless, eternal, covenantal love for you. It is God's personal commitment to your well-being in any situation not based on your performance. It's like God took a nuclear bomb of His hesed, His love, and dropped it directly on you. He's not going to stop loving you. No matter what situation you're in, no matter how fierce the storm is in your life. The New Testament continues this theme of God's love that's rooted in the Old Testament Hesed. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, Paul writes, For I am sure that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In a literal storm, visibility is low. It's hard to see. In life storms, these truths can be hard to see. And I don't know who said this, but it's solid gold. The things that we realize in the light, we should never doubt in the dark. See, we believe that God is never going to leave us. We believe that God's always going to love us when it's sunny. But those things are still true when it's stormy. On your own, you cannot handle the storm. You cannot live in the eye of the storm on your own strength. You're a generator without gas. You're a flashlight without batteries. You are a lamp with no oil. But living in the eye of your storms means you know that storms are going to come. You know that God's going to use them for a purpose in your life. You also know you don't have to face them alone and God hasn't left you empty handed. But finally, here's one more to help us get through. I need God's promises through my storms. God has promises. He's good on them. He keeps them. But did you realize that the best part of God's promises haven't happened yet? Romans chapter 8, verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed. Paul's saying, it might be bad now, oh, but just you wait. It doesn't compare to what's next. We've got to recognize that all of our storms and suffering and trials in this life are just that. They are only temporary. This life is so temporary, it's so short compared to eternity because we are made for, we are going to another world. In this other world, this other place that God has designed for us, this heaven, this new Jerusalem, is a place of subtraction. And you say, subtraction? That sounds like my life now, getting things taken away from me. That doesn't sound so good. But just listen to what's going to be subtracted. Revelation chapter 21, verses 4 and 5. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Here's what's going away. Crying, mourning, pain, and death. Are you okay with that? I'm okay with that. And what this means is there's no more children that will be abused. No more broken homes. No more people hungry and homeless on the street. No more politicians, elections, or cable news. That means no more chemo because there's no cancer, there's no NICUs, there's no more abortions, no more caskets, hospice beds, graveyards, funerals, no more death, no more sin. This is the day when God is going to make all things right and set all things straight. And that day is coming. He will take those things away from us. But in God's arithmetic, He's not just subtracting. You realize He's also adding. In glory, He's going to give so much to His people. But here's two to remember in your storms. First of all, he's going to give you a new body. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 44. It is sown a natural body. That's what you have. But it's going to be raised a spiritual body. That's what you're going to get. See, right now we're a saved soul in a sinful body and world. When we die, our soul goes to be with the Lord and our body goes into the ground. At the resurrection, God's going to unite our soul and body and transform us into what's known as a glorified body. Now, Christ's body after his resurrection is a prototype or first fruits for that. Remember what they did to Christ's body? They recognized him, they touched him, they ate with him. And those same things are going to apply to us in glory. We're not going to be floating around in togas on clouds, playing harp, singing worship songs. We're going to be recognizable. We're going to do a lot of the same work and activities that we do now. This body of yours, it's not going to age. It's not going to wear out. It's not going to get sick. It won't need medicine. It won't break. 
Another thing that God adds to us is not only a new glorified body, but we're also going to get rewards. You see, at judgment, believers are going to stand at what's known as the Bema Seat. And this is a phrase for the games that happened during Bible times where they would stand on an elevated platform and these athletes would be awarded wreaths or crowns for their accomplishments. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says that we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. See, at this time, we're not going to be judged for heaven or hell. Christ took care of that. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's already settled. But at judgment, believers will stand before God and be rewarded accordingly for how they serve the Lord here on earth. And we're not all going to be rewarded the same. There's no sanctified socialism in heaven. We're going to be given responsibilities in the kingdom based on our faithfulness here. And remember this in your suffering. The way you endure those temporary trials are directly connected to your eternal reward. We're coming up on about 20 years since we had our daughter Emily. And we were pretty young when we had her, but she's been such a blessing to us. And I remember the day that she was born. They don't call it labor and delivery for nothing. My wife labored and, and she was in pain. And if you were to ask her, hey, I know that was pretty brutal having that baby. If you had it to do over again, would you do it? She and along with every other mother would say a million times over because the joy of the baby was worth the suffering. Jesus gives us this example in John chapter 16, verses 21 and 22. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice so that no one will take your joy from you. See, if we honor God in our temporary suffering, we're going to have the joy of his reward one day and it's all going to be worth it. R.C. Sproul said that suffering is a bridge to glory. Let's lock arms as a church and cross that bridge faithfully together. As we wrap up our time in the Word, uh, we recently found my grandmother's biscuit recipe. I don't remember all that's on there, but I remember there's things like shortening and baking powder and flour and a few other ingredients. Now, if I were just to take a tub of shortening and take the lid off and begin to eat it, as much as it looks like frosting and icing, it's going to be bitter. It's going to be bad. I would never do that. But when you take those bitter, bad ingredients and you mix them together with other ingredients and they're baked under the suffering of a fire, we come out with something good, biscuits. Well, you remember that a lot of life is like shortening. A lot of our life here is like baking powder. A lot of our life is like flour. On its own, it doesn't seem so good, but when it's tested under the fire of God's suffering, He uses it for His glory and our good. Today, if, if you're in Christ, can I just tell you, this life is not your best life. The very worst is happening to you right now. The best is to come. But if you're going through some of that worst stuff and you need prayer from our pastors or staff, you need to sit down and visit with someone, please let us know. It would be our joy to help you carry that heavy load of your pain in prayer and counsel. If you're watching and you're not in Christ today, I gotta say this in love, there's not a thing I said that applies to you. You have no shelter in the midst of your storms. And this life right now, it is your best life. And the worst is to come. You deserve it, I deserve it, we all deserve it. But please hear the good news. It doesn't have to be that way. Christ, the ultimate sufferer, came to earth and suffered on your behalf by dying on the cross. He was buried and he rose again. If you don't have the Lord as your Savior, would you contact us? We have pastors and staff that would love to tell you about how you can have that future hope in Christ. Well, I'm going to pray for us. And if you need to contact us for anything that you've heard in the message today, please reach out to us. Our doors are always open. Our phones are available to you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. For those going through a difficult storm right now, God, I pray that you'd apply the principles of your word into their lives. Help them to see the future hope that's coming and to endure these trials now for your glory, knowing that it's also for our good. Father, for others, they don't have you. They have no hope in their storms. I pray, Spirit of God, you would draw them to salvation, to the ultimate sufferer found in you, Lord Jesus Christ. And we do, we pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus.
Amen.